Now that you know how to create simple particles and how to create particle systems, I can teach you how to make particle emitters. This is just a way to emit your particles somewhere in the room over some sort of region or you can have it follow another object. It's just another way to do it. And to let you know right up front, this also takes up room in your memory. It will buffer a spot in the memory. So that means as I showed you in the previous video, you will need to destroy your systems. I'm doing it in the game end, but there are many other times you would want to destroy your system or your emitter. And I'll show you that as we go on. So what's changed is I've got in my create event all the different ways I'm initializing my particles. Um, here's the system, just like before, nothing special here. And then I've got a second particle type I'm going to be using, and I'll explain that when we get into what particles can do after they die. And here's the particle emitter. Same thing as before, nothing special. So in this script for the emitter, it's not really anything that's too crazy or different from before, except I've added a few lines that deal with emitters. Now, I guess I'll show you what it looks like right now, just so you understand all the different particle setups, but it's not too different from what I had before. So here it is. I mean, I've got my particle count, and that's hovering just above 200 here. I've got my frames, my real frames per second going, so it's not capped to the room speed. And it's because I haven't really defined anywhere for my particles to be, they default to zero, zero over here. So all my particles are just being emitted there um, because I'm using a particle emitter at the moment and I haven't told it where to be. So this is just kind of a default location for it. So let's tell it to go somewhere. What I've added at the very bottom is this part about emitting particles and I've chosen part emitter stream. This is one way to have an emitter put particles on the, on the screen and this is from a stream so it's isolated to one location and it just sprays them out. You can also do it in a burst and we'll get into both. If I middle click or mouse click three, part emitter stream says streams particles every step from the given emitter. So nothing really out of the ordinary, it's exactly how it's described. But what we want to concentrate on here is First of all, obviously I'm choosing the particle system. If you remember, that's the container that my particles are in. And then I choose the emitter I want to use, and I only have one, which is the particle emitter, part M, and which type, this is what the particles will look like. And I'm just using part type, that's the one that I have. And then per step, how many particles are emitted. Now, what we can do, if I uncomment that, we have part type, sorry, part emitter region. This will define a place in the room where all of the particles can appear. So it'll, it'll pick spots randomly based on a distribution. And I'll show you that. So this is uh, kind of long, it goes off screen here. First, as usual, we pick the particle system. So it's just the one we have, that container. And inside we want the index. That's always indexing whatever's over here. So we're indexing a uh, an emitter. So I've got part M. And now we define the region. So we want to know on the x-axis the minimum and maximum location it can be. I've chosen zero, which is all the way on one side of the room, and the room width, which is a variable, that is whatever the maximum size of my room is on the x-axis. And then I've done the same for y. You choose a y minimum and a y maximum, zero being the top of the room and room height being whatever I've defined inside my room as the height. So this region is the entire room. Now we get into the two most important parts about this function. We get to shape as an argument and we get into distribution. So I'm going to middle click or mouse three on region here and bring us to shape. And if I scroll down, it's going to be particle system, PS here, and then shape. And then we can choose from four different shapes. This is going to be where our particles can be spawned inside of our region. And we can use rectangle, which is as it sounds going to be this square or rectangle shape, which is right here, we'll take up the whole region. We can use an ellipse, which is like a circle or oval. So the bounding box that we define is like this, and it's just putting them in a circle. We can make a diamond, like this, picking the midpoints and then distributing them in between, or simply a line which goes from the minimum and of uh, the x and y to the maximum here. So we've got that as well. 
So that's all well and good, but we also have distribution. And that's down here. There are three ways we can distribute the particles. We can do it on a linear system. So this means that it'll distribute the particles equally. It has an even chance of appearing anywhere within our region. We can do Gaussian, which means more will spawn in the center. And then as it moves out from the center, less and less will spawn, kind of fading or feathering away. And then we can invert that Gaussian and have more appear on the outside and less in the middle. So it's kind of like feathers into the center. This usually works best Gaussian if you want to have a very central position for things like smoke. Smoke obviously comes from one very tight central position and then moves out. Smoke doesn't usually do this kind of shape, but you play around with it depending on what kind of particle you're using. I mean, even blood would most likely come from a source and then splatter out. So in this case, I've just chosen rectangle, so that'll occupy the entire region, and linear, which means it will equally spawn anywhere within this rectangular region. But enough babbling about it, let's just see what it looks like. And here we are. Rather than it all clumping up at the default 0, 0, I've told it to have this as the minimum value for x and y, and here's the maximum value for x and y. Then I said spawn in a rectangular pattern, and linearly, which is anywhere evenly spread out. So here we go, I've got my little smoke puffs that wiggle around, grow and fade away, and they are evenly distributed in this range, which is pretty good. Now, let's look at some of the other options. Um, I can do ellipse. This is that circular pattern, so obviously it will start in the center and evenly distribute more in a circle, which is hard to see, but it's a little less on these edges now. Um, because it is linear, which is kind of bad for a circle. So if we change this to Gaussian, this will clump everything in the center, fade away to the edges. This will look a little more uh, appropriate for a circular shape. So as you can see, now it's clumped more in the center and it spreads out further and further as it goes. So this definitely shows off our circular shape. And we can do the same for line, which Personally, I think line would be better if it were back to an even distribution. So let's take a look at that one. So this should be a simple line from the min to the max. Um, there we go. So from the minimum values to the maximum values, and it's just linearly distributed. So you can kind of get an idea of all the different ways you can place these around the room. Okay, now that we understand that, we can also use burst instead of stream. And the difference is that a burst will do one step only. So this is just like one puff, right? So it won't continually step. It's not a stream. It's not constantly flowing like a stream of water. It's just puff once. That's it. Back like when I had the particle system, when I clicked, it would create it. This will do it on its own. So this is asking for the system, the index, which this is an emitter, so we're looking for an emitter here, so par emitter. And then inside that emitter, inside that system, what do we want our particles to look like, which is the particle type. And I've stored that in par type, and I'm telling it to make 10. So once, it'll just puff 10. So I'm going to have to load this up and talk over top of it, because it'll happen quite quickly. Now, this is obviously still on that line, but there, puff. <laughs> um, I don't know if you saw that, but... So let's go back to something that'll clump it together. I'll choose ellipse and we'll concentrate it in the center here. So we'll choose Gaussian and okay, so here comes the puff. Get ready for it. We're going to have 10 of them appear. Puff. There we go. That was, that was 10 of them. So pretty simple dif difference to understand. Uh, they take the same arguments too. Is this, this happens once and this happens all the time. So a few things to keep in mind about emitters because they're constantly in memory and they're constantly happening until you tell them to, hey, stop doing that. Um, one important thing to keep in mind is there are ways to stop it. Now, I've got on the event release space the particle clear. So I can use part emit emitter clear and I choose the system and the index being the emitter. I use part M and this means that it'll return all of the settings to default for that emitter. So what that means if we go back to this stream here and have them nice puffy concentrated in this circle is that if I release the space key 
Now it's not creating them anymore, and any of the other ones that were already there dissipate and die as they should. So what I've done with that space key is just clear it. Uh, for better understanding, let's just pop in here. Clears the settings of a given emitter. That's all it does. It's still technically there, and it's still technically in memory. I didn't destroy it. So be careful, that's not what that does. That's in here with part emitter destroy. This just simply reset everything to default, so it's not reading any information. It's So it's not going to puff out any of our particles. Now, smoke is all well and good, and all the built-in game maker particles are kind of limiting. Well, we know that. Yo-Yo Games knows that. So what you're allowed to do, and we'll hop back into, if I remember where it is, it's in the create event. We can use, instead of type shape, which was the explosion I was using, we're going to go with type sprite. This references a sprite you've used. I've created this little ugly smiley face. And once again, you need your index. That's this one right here. So it's looking for a type. So I'm using par type. And then the sprite you're going to use. That's my uh, particle, obviously. Now we get these ones. So this argument is asking animation. So this is, do you want to animate, I believe? We've got whether to follow the animation as normal. So should it go through with the animating or whatever? Uh, I have it as false. There aren't any frames anyway. It's not animating. The next one is stretch. This is pretty interesting. This is... Should the animation last as long as the life of the particle? So rather than, let's say, if I had only four frames of animation, that goes by really quickly, but the particle lasts like six seconds. Well, we could say, yes, true for stretch, which could be false or true or zero or one. And what will happen is those frames, it'll mathematically spread them over the six seconds. So that's if you have planned out your animation and you don't want to keep making frames and retiming it, you just say like, yeah, stretch it out for as long as the particle exists. Then you can play with the timing of the particle. You know, in this case, it's lasting for half a second to a second. Um, and the very last one is random. That's whether or not I should choose a random sub-image, whether to choose a random sub-image at startup, which I want as false. I want it to start with zero, the very first frame of my animation, the very first sub-image. So with that in mind, uh, it should look exactly the same as the explosions, but now I've got smiley faces. So, I don't know. It's more lively, I guess you could say. Um, there we go. They're rotating and jiggling and puffing out and fading away. Now, the next cool thing I want to talk about with particles is it's all well and good that they're created and then they have some sort of life and then they die. But what if we want to do something a little more interesting? What if we want another particle to come out of it? Okay. For that, I've created a second particle. So I've got par type, and I'm going to create that one. And I now I've got a second par type, which is number two. And here are all the stats for it. It's pretty much the same uh, as one of my previous videos with the stars that I had. It's just multicolored stars that puff out. So what we do is down here where I've talked about the lifespan, I've got one about death, which is a very grim word, but here's what it is part type death. And this comes with three very simple arguments. Um, one is the index. So this is the um, one you are starting from, I believe. The index of, yeah, the particle change. So whichever one you're affecting <laughs> is the starting. And the next one is the death number. This is the quantity of the new particle to create at the particle death. Um, so should one particle when it dies um, it wants to know how many more it should create from that one particle. So I've chosen one, which means if one particle dies, only one new particle is created. Um, I can make one explode into a second one and another, and you know it'll grow like exponentially if I want. It kind of works for fireworks if you kind of want that effect. Um, it's stating here too you can use negative, in which case it'll choose. Um, it has like a pass fail system. So if I had minus you know, one, two, three, in this case, three, uh, it would only create one every three steps or so. It just becomes a fraction as it states. Um, and then, you know, what should it become? So I've chosen our second particle. Now you gotta be aware here, if I didn't do that and I said, okay, create the same one, what's gonna happen? Particle type one, my smiley face is that, as it were right now, would explode and create the same system which would then explode and create the same system and create the same, should I say, t 
type, not system, but it'll create this loop, infinite loop of particles exploding, creating more particles and more particles. So that's something to keep in mind. Don't do it. Uh, explode into different ones if you can. Best idea. I believe there is even a warning down here. Never use the same particle. So uh, Yo-Yo Games is even more stern about it. Um, but here's what it'll look like if one particle on its death creates one more particle. And there we go. Boom, boom, boom. So uh, this was a bad idea to have them streaming because it's constantly going. But it's the best way to demonstrate um, how this looks. So what's happening, uh, I'll put it on burst to get a better idea. So that only happened once. But what's happening is the smiley face particle, yay, is doing its thing where it's created. It gets larger, it fades away, and then when it's done, whatever its lifespan is in time, it'll create the next particle, which is the stars. So let's keep an eye out here for the little puff of 10 particles, and then they should create 10 more. So puff and puff, puff, puff. So there we go. That's how you can turn. And, and if I wanted, I could make that go even further. Particle 2, if I went into there, could have a section on death. And then that become Particle 3. And then I can keep doing that and they can keep exploding to more and different. Like I said, it's kind of cool for fireworks um, where you have one thing that explodes. And then like, you know, six sparks come out of that. And then six sparks come out of that. And it's like an explosion like fireworks. And that's kind of one of the cooler things that you can do. So now that we know for the most part particles can stay where they are within a specified region, now let's learn about making them move around, because that's probably more interesting. Now to do that, let's turn off this particle emitter we were just using. Make sure they're all off. Uh, these are fine, these are the creations, this is just the one from death. Now in my end step, I've got one that's quite similar to what we were just using. Except when it comes to the region here. What I've done for the min and max for the X and Y is I've actually set it to another object in the room. So the minimum X value is go going to be the object face, this little guy down here, his X position, and then I'm going to give a little buffer for the region. So I'm going to give uh, minus 32 and plus 32 with minus 32 and plus 32. So I got this box. Uh, just around this face. Now for that to work in the room, not only do we need the particle system, uh, and let's move that way off to zero so we know that it's not this object that's doing it. It's going to be this face object, which is actually very tiny. Um, but it should work. So now just by simply altering where the minimum and maximum X and Y values are inside of the region function, it's going to continually update because I put it in the step event. Now, particularly I put it in the end step. And that's because this guy is going to be moving around using the step event. He's just going to kind of wiggle around. Uh, and I've clamped him to the room. We haven't gone over that function, but he won't leave the room with this function. After all the steps are done, Game Maker moves to the end step. Still part of the step event, but these will take place after the steps. So using an end step is better for following an object because what happens is Game Maker updates the new position for this object in its step event. And then when all the steps are done, we go to the end step. And the end step will now look at, okay, what's the position of object face? Uh, if I did them both at step, they could go off sync from each other. But by doing it this way, it waits for the object face to move before being displayed on the screen. And um, I don't know, here's what it looks like. So there it is. We've got our object face moving around and we've got our smoke following it. The only issue we now have is a depth issue. So let's simply correct that. Let's see, we've got a depth of zero on both of them. Well, let's just make that minus one for the face to have them pop closer to the screen. And that should uh, solve our problem. And then our smoke will be behind the face. I mean, obviously in front of it would be best if you were on fire or something. But just so you can see that it is following the face, which is jittering around erratically. But there we go. Simply by changing the region and having it in a step event and update according to another moving object... There we go. It, it, it will follow it. It won't just be static. So that's just proof that there are ways to have particles follow other objects. You just have to make sure that it's in some sort of update event, like a step event or a draw event or whatever you're using. 
and make sure that the X and Y values are referencing the moving object. Just as an update, I didn't have to actually change the depth here inside these objects. Let's put the face back at zero. There actually is a function for particles, and in my initializing my particles here, um, I can uncomment that and it's part system depth and you can actually set the depth of a system so if I drop this just by one just just further instead of this going negative one it should actually end up with the same result because they're now offset by just one in depth so I didn't have to change the object I could have actually set the depth of the particles and what's cool about that is you can now uh, affect that number so if this were not in the create event and it were in the step event and I made that number constantly change over time, then I can constantly change the depth of particles. If I needed them to start low, like in, like something was in the background and f came into the foreground or vice versa, then you know you can affect it using part system depth and you don't actually have to affect the object itself. Just one more way you can use depth with particles. So the last thing to keep in mind, and I kind of touched on it with particle clear, which still means that it's buffered in memory, it just clears the settings, you know, you have to destroy it, is please destroy your particles when you're done with them, okay? Um, you can always um, put them in again later somewhere else in your game. Just make sure um, when you use particles, create them, use them, destroy them because one you don't want that to take up memory that's going to slow down your game it's unnecessary uh you'll create memory leaks and the other one is uh it's independent of room it will just keep streaming even when you change room so all i've done here is on my right arrow key release go to next room right i did not write this myself i just used the drag and drop um stuff because I just found that really easy to do in this case. Now I've got a second room here and nothing's in it. There are no objects, no instances to prove it to you. I'll click this instance order, nothing. Now if I were to run this game, let's make sure that we're streaming this time. So they're, they're happening infinitely, not just one little puffy burst. What will happen in this case is I'll go to another room and the particles will persist. See, okay, here they are. This is this is fine. You can tell I'm in the first room because I've got this GUI stuff writing. But if I were to go into the next room, what? It's still happening. And that's because particles are independent of rooms. What you have to do is destroy them. So make sure when you go into a new room, destroy them or Better yet, when you're not using the particles anymore, destroy them. Destroy, destroy, destroy. Problem now, right? I'm in a new room, which means this object here, this object particle system, doesn't exist. I can hit spacebar all I want, and they're not going to clear because this object's not here to read the command, which means I can't even do that, which also means I can't even destroy them. If you remember, it's in this object, which is not in this room. So I can't stress that enough. Simply... When you're done with your particles, destroy them. They will persist. They will eat memory. They'll just sit there in their memory. Anyway, talked enough about this, guys. Uh, I hope you now have a more robust understanding of particles. And keep in mind, this wasn't quite all of the things you can do with particles. There are a few more things. You can always check to see if an emitter exists. Like you can say, hey, does my emitter exist? If so, destroy. Things like that. So I didn't really go into those because they're a little more... I don't know, mundane. I want to show you the fun part of particles. And now in this three-part series, you have a very good understanding of what you can do with particles.